Okay, wow. Uh, thanks for having me. I have not been to a Zoom meeting in a while. Um, so this is amazing. Uh, really welcome to everybody who's um, newer and yeah, I'm excited to be here. So my sobriety date is June 7th of 2018. That was the first day I went to a meeting. And so, yes, I just celebrated four years. And yeah, it has been life changing, I will say. So uh, what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. What it was like, I uh, grew up in a pretty large family and I was one of five kids and there was a lot going on, a lot of other siblings, getting a lot of attention. And I think that I, you know, was very disconnected from my family. And I'm just honestly came to this realization quite recently. And I started drinking at about 16. And I was off to the races immediately. I, I, it was a way for me to escape. That's, I think all I ever wanted was just to escape either how I felt. I just didn't quite understand what was exactly wrong with me. But right away, I started drinking a lot, drinking every day in high school. I would drink at work. Sometimes I blacked out and somehow I didn't get fired from that job. I would have, you know, bottles of trunk, bottles of uh, like vodka in my trunk, go out to lunch uh, on my, on my break at, uh, at, not at work, but at school and drink out of my trunk. So, you know, that's not exactly what everyone else is doing. <laughs> bringing water bottle, you know, to high school and drinking, uh, you know, flavor, weird, weird flavored Bacardi out of a water bottle at school. Anyway, you get the idea. I was off to the races immediately and I really liked the, the feeling of escaping and I drank to oblivion. I would drink to, to blackout. Now I did actually somehow graduate high school and went to college it was kind of a narrow miss there. You know, I got kicked off of like the swim team. My grades were kind of tanking in high school. I kind of got it together for going to college and I kind of shifted my, um, my escapes, right? I was like binge drinking and blacking out on the weekends. And during the week, I would be obsessing about schoolwork and just like pouring myself into that. And I saw that as, as a way to escape. Um, should have started a timer here unless I'm sure someone else is finding me but um so yes college was a way to um escape as well and I somehow also made it through college and graduated and at the end of of college I had lined up a job and just broken up with my boyfriend and it was like oh it's nothing's tying me down. It's time to go. Like, all I have to do is, is graduate this semester and I've got a job. And my uh, disease really escalated from there. I started drinking. Every time I drank, I blacked out. Every time I drank, I blacked out and it became like, oh my God, what did I do? So much shame. Like, just trying to figure out and retrace what had happened. Sometimes I did not want to know what happened. I woke up in strange places with strange people that I would not have ever, ever have done. And, you know, I would, I would say to myself, like tonight, I'm just going to have, you know, like a beer. And then I would wake up in a strange place and say, well, what happened? I blacked out. I had somehow gotten talked into taking shots. I was probably over there saying, give me all the shots. And yeah, it got really bad there um, at the end of, of college. And when I first started my job, which I'm still at today, actually, <clears throat> but I, w I did some very embarrassing things in front of other people that I worked with. I mean, it was, it got bad at the end. And I did have like a near death experience towards the end of my actual drinking, which I had once again, blacked out. And, and fell asleep on the couch, lying face up. I had vomited in my sleep. I got very lucky in that I turned my head just enough that it came out of my mouth instead of suffocating. Cause I know that I know people who have died that way. 
And, you know, that still wasn't quite a wake up call. I still drank um, after that. But I had what I, I kind of uh, describe as some sort of spiritual experience before I really knew, you know, higher power um, that I found in the program. I, you know, had this kind of epiphany, if you will, that if I drink again, I'm going to die. And I, you know, there's some more details to that, but I won't go into it. And I put down the drink and I never picked it up again. Now, that's when I was 22 years old. I didn't make it to the program until I was 29. So I had a long period of time where I did not. Uh, I didn't drink, but I also didn't have a program. I didn't know anybody who was sober and that sort of thing. So basically, I stopped drinking. But what happened to me was I... Again, like I did in college, tried to pour myself into some other sort of escape. So my escape became ice hockey. I played ice hockey. I would play it five days a week. I'd play other sports. I mean, basically my escape was, you know, endorphins and trying to feel a part of through being on sports teams. And so it, it can, you know, simulate that sort of connection. But as the years, you know, it was okay at first, but as the years went on, I started to realize that I had no connection to other people. I started feeling extremely isolated. I wanted to drink. It was really hard for me to be around alcohol. And uh, in the, the ice hockey world, it's a very heavy drinking culture. And so I was around alcohol a lot. I would go on these trips with my women's team across the country and we would, you know, there would be a lot of drinking and it, it became so miserable. And I did not understand what was wrong with me. I knew that if I were to drink, I were to die, but I didn't understand that I had stopped drinking and yet something was still wrong. And, you know, hockey stopped working for me. It was no longer the escape that was sufficient. And yeah, I started to have situations where I would start reaching out for help I would have these glimmer, like this glimpse of like, I need to ask for help. And I would kind of put my, you know, toe in the water and say, and say to somebody, you know, I need help. And they might say to me, you know, like, oh, well, you know, my mom, she did AA and that's what worked for her. And I just kept thinking to myself, but I don't know that that's for me. And I was, I felt a lot of shame around wanting help when I grew up. Growing up, that's not something you did. You don't talk about feelings. You don't ask for help. You kind of just deal with things yourself. And so it almost, I mean, having the ego of like, oh, no, everything's fine. You know, I have a house. I have a job. I have a car. You know, I have friends. Nothing's wrong. But why do I feel this way? And so I went to one of my best friend's weddings. I was in her wedding party. and. I was at the after party. Again, this was a very hard situation for me because it was around alcohol. And one of my friend's dads noticed that I wasn't drinking. He said, oh, you're not, you don't drink? I said, oh no, or you're not drinking? I, I don't, I don't drink. He's like, oh, I don't either. You know, I'm, I'm 25 years sober. And I said, I kind of broke down and I said, you know, I, I think I need help. And he was kind of confused and like, okay, well, you know, do you have some sort of support system? Like, what do you, what do you have? And I said, I don't, I don't know anybody. I don't know anyone who's, who is sober. And he said, okay, well, you probably need to go to AA and get a community. And I was like, ah, oh, maybe, maybe, but I still didn't want to do that. I still was just clinging on to like, no, I don't need help. Maybe it'll just pass. It'll just go away. It's fine. Just kept shoving everything down like I had been for the last, you know, six and a half years. And I was also using dating apps to fill the void, you know? And one of the guys I was talking to was saying, you know, just to be honest, you know, I'm in recovery. Um, you know, I don't drink. And I was like, oh. I don't drink either, but I think I need help. I reached out again, and this whole time is definitely my higher power, like giving me these chances. 
Um, and he was like, let's meet at a meeting. I'm like, sure. Or we could just go to coffee, you know. <laughs> so I met him at a meeting and it was terrifying. I, anyone who comes to a meeting for the first time, I think is just the most courageous thing because I was absolutely terrified. It felt like I was coming with my deepest, darkest secret and I was going to tell a bunch of people or reveal myself to a bunch of people. And that was so terrifying to me. But I showed up and, you know, I saw the, the group of uh, people smoking and vaping. I kind of went over and like immediately they're, of course, like, oh, my gosh, welcome. Like, so glad you're here. You know, everybody's so happy at AA meetings. And I was just like really trying to hold it together. And like I was just suffering so much. I just I was wearing sunglasses and I was like already like starting to tear up that I was like going to come to this place and admit, you know that I needed help from these people. Anyway, the guy was not there yet. He was going to be late. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm at this meeting and this guy is not even going to be here. That was the only reason I was going to go was because I was going to know somebody there. It was just too terrifying to be alone. And which just for context, I travel internationally alone before this, like, but I couldn't go to an AA meeting alone. So in this meeting, you know, I made it through the meeting. And the chair person came up to me after and, you know, was just wanted me to get set up with a big book and all this stuff. And I just broke down and I, I finally like really surrendered and like, I need help. And like, I'm like, please tell me what to do. So I got these girls' phone numbers um, from the meeting and like, I still know them to this day. It's, it's really awesome. But, um, and that guy is, was very good. He, he did not, you know, do any funny business. He handed me off to the, you know, the women in the, in the meeting and we are still friends to this day. We played hockey together. So like, um, I, I owe him like really my life, for, like bringing me into the program, getting me through the door. Um, so. I, you know, went to another meeting, I got a sponsor, I worked, you know, I started working the steps, and this, it was a very raw time, it was very raw to go through the steps and not have felt my feelings for this long, you know, I had been shoving them down this whole time, and even though I didn't have a substance to cover them up, I had found other ways to cover them up. And uh, so I'm suddenly feeling all of my feelings so strongly. And the steps are just raw. It is a raw thing to look at yourself. You know, I had never, the fourth step for me, I had never admitted to myself many, many of the things that I put on that list. And then I had never admitted any of them to another person. And my fifth step, I revealed things to my sponsor that I would, I was going to, I was prepared to take to the grave. But she had told me, how free do you want to be? And that was like, yeah, I mean, I'm suffering so miserably. I want relief. Like if I, at this point, you know, the step, I still hadn't had relief from, from uh, the obsession over alcohol. And <clears throat> I got immense, like a weight lifted after I did my fifth step and, and kind of like unloaded that stuff and saw my part. And that was very heavy and the hour of meditation. And of course the immense process went way better than I ever could have imagined it went. And I got to have a lot of conversations with people about, because I was dry for that whole time, many years, a lot of my amends were related to what I had done to people when I was not drinking. <laughs> and you can still be an asshole when you're not drinking, right? And actually more so for me, honestly, because there's not a solution and you're just like not feeling good. Um, so yeah, I'd make amends uh, for that kind of stuff. And a lot of it was also like, you know, I'm sorry, I never like told you what was happening in my life. I had, I had never let anybody in. And I suddenly had in the program deep meaningful connections with other humans and I had never had that before and by or 
you know, by the ninth step, I did have the obsession lifted um, over alcohol. Thank you. Uh, three minutes left. Um, yeah, I had had the obsession lifted. And I had been obsessed the whole time, the whole time I wasn't drinking. So it's, it is really more than just not drinking. I mean, that's definitely the first step is not drinking, but you know, if you don't have a program like I did, it could get really bad and really miserable. And that's definitely given me a gift of desperation. Like today I do everything exactly the same that I did when I came in four years ago. I go to three meetings a week. I have commitments at those meetings. I call through, well, I try to call through alcoholics a day. Um, I get on my knees and I pray. I um, have a fellowship and connection with other people. And yeah, I really just try to think about other people. So when I came in here, I was very selfish. And now I get to think about other people and I get to show up and be of service when I'm asked. And yeah, I have an amazing life today. Like it's, I didn't lose material things. I lost my mind and my sanity. And I feel at peace today, which is amazing. And yeah, I have a community today. And anytime something comes up, I've been going through a lot this last year and someone else in the program will have experienced it. There is somebody else out there. You are not alone. You do not have to do this alone. And that's, I think, one of the greatest gifts of this program. Thanks.